Hello and welcome to this evening's cardiology webinar. My name is Hannah and I'm Senior Referral Coordinator here at BBS. I will be introducing our speaker, Dr. Joelle Neves, as he presents an update on the diagnosis and management of feline cardiac disease. So for those of you who are meeting VVS for the first evening, welcome, and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. We have a team of friendly, knowledgeable veterinary specialists whose mission it is to improve your access to specialist veterinary healthcare, increasing collaboration between first opinion vets and specialists in the industry. With our sophisticated video and diagnostic platform, we empower first opinion vets to deliver specialist level care to their own patients in their own clinics. BVS specialists are on hand to support your veterinary team, your patients and their owners with affordable, timely help. With the launch of our Halter Monitor service, we have further expanded the virtual support available to you from BVS. This allows us to provide seamless continuity for your VVS cardiology referral patients requiring at-home ECG monitoring. All recordings are analysed and reported by the VVS team of cardiology specialists ensuring not only case continuity, but easily accessible and tailored follow-up support too. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joelle Neves, European Specialist in Veterinary Cardiology. Joelle graduated in 2009 and began working in general practice in Portugal with a focus on cardiology. He moved to the UK in January in 2013 to undertake a cardiology internship at the University of Liverpool followed by a 13-month rotating internship programme at Dick White Referrals. In 2014, Joelle began his residency in small animal cardiology at the University of Liverpool. And after completing his residency, he was promoted to lecturer in small animal cardiology before joining Willow's Referral Service in 2018, where he worked for four years, becoming a European specialist in small animal cardiology in 2021. Joelle has recently moved back to Portugal a little earlier this year and now works within two veterinary cardiology centres, lectures in veterinary cardiology, um, in, lectures in a veterinary college in Lisbon and continues to support UK vets with us here at VVS. We're therefore really lucky to have Joel presenting his debut VVS webinar tonight after joining us recently. Um, so we hope you enjoy. If you do have any questions as we go through, please do pop them in the chat box and we'll finish up the presentation with a question and answer session at the end. So without further ado, I will hand over to Joelle. Joelle. Hi Anna, thanks so much for um, the very nice presentation about VVS and about myself as well. And um, I would like to welcome all the attendees um, to this talk. I, I hope that you are not very tired from uh, today's work. And, um, and today's talk will be on um, uh, feline um, cardiomyopathies, okay? And basically, um, I will uh, present... Um, uh, sorry. Okay, sorry. So basically, um, what uh, uh, the topic is, is basically what I was saying was about feline cardiac disease. It's in a kind of an update and a refresh as well on this topic. And I will not discuss uh, specifically um, uh, HCM, uh, you know, restrictive cardiomyopathy, because unfortunately, over the last years, we have done great advances on uh, mitral valve disease, but we have not um, done such a good advances in feline cardiomyopathy. So unfortunately, uh, at the moment, diagnosing and even treating uh, feline cardiomyopathy is kind of similar there are a few particularities that I will mention later on, but the, um, in somehow the, our approach to diagnosis and even treatment is quite similar um, if we consider the main feline cardiomyopathies. okay? So to start uh, our talk, I'd like to discuss that we can have primary cardiomyopathies, and the primary cardiomyopathies are the ones that uh, we have an intrinsic abnormality in the myocardium. So most of the times it's a genetic problem, okay? Um, and then we have the secondary uh, cardiomyopathies, okay? That are basically we have an issue, we have an, uh, an abnormality in the myocardium, but this is usually caused by uh, an extra cardiac cause, you know, hyperthyroidism, systemic hypertension, acromegaly. If we are giving, let's say, a chemotherapy agent that can cause toxic, toxic cardiomyopathy, um, 
uh, myocarditis, for instance, as well, or even infiltrative disease. And th then we used to have, we don't have it as much now, but used to have uh, the, the taurine and nutritional cardiomyopathy that used to affect cats a long time ago. And, and the main primary cardiomyopathies uh, are those ones here, okay? So I will just uh, use my, um, my pen here, okay? So that we have the most common one, okay? Which is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then we have the restrictive cardiomyopathy, okay? And in general terms, the, the big difference between these two is that on HCM, okay, we have a, a stiff and thick uh, left ventricle. And on restricted cardiomyopathy, um, the thickening of the, um, of the wall is not seen. So it's mostly a stiff ventricle. And we can have two forms mainly, okay? We can have the number one here, that is the myocardial form, we have, where we have fibrosis um, um, uh, in the myocardium. And then you have the, the endomyocardial form, okay? And the endomyocardial form has two different presentations. Okay, we have the number two here, which is uh, where we have a very white tissue here that represents fibrosis. So we have what we call an endomyocardial fibrosis that sometimes is so, so thick that can obliterate the inner cavity of the, uh, of the left ventricle. And then we have also this form here of the endomyocardial uh, form of restricted cardiomyopathy, where we have this very large bridging scar okay, that connects the, the interventricular septum and the left ventricular free wall. And then nowadays it's quite rare to see as well, but uh, we have also this arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy that mostly affects the, 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 you know, the right ventricle myocardium. Uh, basically we, we have degeneration of the myocardium and then that is replaced by fatty tissue and fibrotic tissue, okay? And then the dilatic, dilatic cardiomyopathy, although it's here as a primary one, which means that it will be genetic, it's, it's very uncommon we do see you know, dilatic cardiomyopathy as a genetic issue. We usually used to see a long time ago a dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype as, an, uh, as, a, as, a, as a consequence of the lack of taurine in most of our cat foods, okay? And then we have the unclassified cardiomyopathy. At the moment, we don't call it unclassified cardiomyopathy. We call it non-specific cardiomyopathy. And that means basically that we are looking at an echo, okay? And we are looking at a heart that does not fit any of these categories, okay? Of primary uh, feline cardiomyopathies. And then we have obviously, obviously these secondary ones, uh, secondary cardiomyopathies that are secondary to all these conditions that I mentioned before, okay? Let's see now um, the staging, which is uh, now, um, um, you know, something that is important for us to do, mostly because we have a consensus that was published in 2020 and that uh, basically suggested, um, you know, a staging that is kind of similar somehow with the one that we usually do for mitral valve disease. So we have the stage uh, A, that is, let's say, a read, like a main coon that is predisposed to develop, let's say, hypertroph hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay, or any other feline cardiomyopathy. We have the stage B1, where we have no or just a very mild enlargement of the left atrium. So we already have the disease here, Okay, so let's say if we are dealing with an HCM patient, so we already have a thickening of the wall, but we don't have really a significant left atrial enlargement. Okay, and then we have the B2 stage where now the left atrium is moderately or severely enlarged, and therefore we can classify this patient as a B2. And why is that important? This is one of the main reasons why we do follow ups in the preclinical stages, because that's where we usually start the medication. Okay, and most of the times is a thrombo, thrombo um, sorry, a clopidogrel as a prophylaxis for um, thromboembolism. Okay, so um, at all these stages from A to B2, we are supposed to have a patient that is asymptomatic. And what I mean asymptomatic is asymptomatic for thromboembolism, okay, or congestive heart failure. And then, then we go to the stage C. C means C for clinical, okay, so uh, that means that we have either pulmonary edema, pleural effusion, or a thrombus, history of having a, an arterial thromboembolism. And obviously, then stage D is the refractory stage that uh, by definition, okay, is when we have uh, more than six milligram per kilo a day, okay, of rosemite to control the clinical signs. 
Now, the question here, which the consensus that doesn't address, okay, is which is the cutoff that we should be using to say is B1 and B2? Because in, in the consensus for mitral disease, we is very clear that the left atrium to aortic root ratio should be higher than 1.6, but the consensus in, uh, that we have for feline cardiomyopathies doesn't really propose a very precise cutoff. However, uh, I think most of the cardiologists, they use two kind of uh, different cutoffs, okay, for the left atrial size. One is the LAO, so the left atrium, atrium to aortic root ratio. And generally, we know that if it's higher than 1.8 or 2, depending on the study, there is a high risk of developing uh, congestive heart failure. So it seems reasonable to consider that if you have a, a LAO bigger than that value, then we probably should, should consider that patient as a B2. And then if you prefer to measure the left atrial maximal dimension, it's also accepted that if it's higher than 8 or 19 millimeters, okay, is also a patient at high risk of developing failure and therefore should be also considered as a B2, okay? But again, there is a, a lot of debate and different cardiologists sometimes use different cutoffs as well. Okay, now a little bit about HCM itself because that's by far the most common. And we are lucky in UK that we have a, a very nice study um, published by Payne in 2015. That's uh, basically is a study with shelter cats, but that is quite representative. So. Just to have an idea, I mean, 40% of the cats in UK, you know, will have heart murmurs, okay? Uh, but this study showed that up to 70%, which is a big percentage, can be just functional, so not attributed to a, a pathology. And it's also important to know that in UK, more or less one in seven cats will have HCM, which is a quite big percentage as well. If we consider a box just with feline cardiomyopathies in UK, uh, HCM will represent around 60%, okay? And then we have the second most common, which is restrictive cardiomyopathy. The third most common, that will be the non-specific cardiomyopathy. And then this arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and obviously this dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype secondary to taurine deficiency, uh, they are actually quite rare. And still about preclinical HCM, there is a very nice study called the REVEAL study that basically look into cats that are in the preclinical stage. And basically they try to follow those cats and see what happened to them, okay? So in fact, only 30% of the uh, um, HCM cats in the preclinical stage will develop one of these outcomes, either an arterial thromboembolism, a congestive heart failure or both, okay? So only of the, this 30% uh, um, uh, percent of the patients will develop clinical signs. 27.9%, so again, around 30% will die of cardiac death. So what this means is not all the patients that have preclinical HCM will eventually develop clinical signs or die of cardiac disease, okay? Obviously, if they develop one of those signs, the shorter, you know, they will have a much shorter survival time. And according to this study, it was around, you know, mean 1.3 years, okay? After developing the clinical signs. But there is still a small percentage of cats that uh, uh, with preclinical disease that can reach nine to 15 years old, okay? So quite, they can still reach the geriatric age, quite, um, uh, you know, and 10% is still a significant amount. Now, how these cats present to us, okay? Well, how, why these cats present to a cardiologist, okay? They can present in the subclinical phase, okay? So without clinical signs um, or, in the clinical phase when they have clinical signs. So when they present uh, to us cardiologists in the subclinical phase, because either because they, you know, they have a heart murmur, okay, they, um, they there was, it was detected a gallop or an arrhythmia, maybe uh, the, the, you know, a probe NP was done because we suspected heart disease and they came out high, or because an X-ray is either intentional or not detected an enlarged cardiac silhouette, okay. But the cats, I used to say that cats, they read books, uh, but they do exactly the opposite, okay? So that's, that's what I, I feel, because obviously they are not as easy uh, as dogs for us to predict heart disease based on, on, on physical exam, okay? For instance, a murmur. We can have a cat without a heart murmur that one presents to us already on the clinical stage, they have already an end-stage disease, a very, a very, very bad, uh, um, um, you know, cardiac remodeling. And also we have cats that have a murmur and when we are looking into them, you know, in fact, the disease is not even there, is a functional murmur, or is, for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, just very mild HCM. So, in fact, there is a study that showed that the positive predicted value for a heart murmur to be, you know, to predict HCM 
is as low as 20 to 4 percent. And obviously, the, the older you get with the cat, the higher it will be because obviously the, the prevalence of HCM will, will also increase with um, with uh, with age. But then, very helpful here as well is uh, uh, the negative predictive value of having uh, of a murmur, basically. Or the, let's say if we don't have a murmur, then the the the, the likelihood of not having HCM is 90 to 100 percent. But bear in mind that this is considered the general population. Obviously, we have much more cats without HCM than with HCM. So obviously, um, that's why it's so high. And now we also know that we can ourselves cause a heart murmur in a cat. Because if you think about it, a dog has a much stronger and harder rib cage, but cats can have a quite collapsible, uh, you know, particularly if they are young. And if you press too hard on the rib cage, we can in fact squeeze the heart and we can cause like a kind of dynamic obstruction, okay? Just also to let, let you know, one of the main reasons for um, a heart murmur in a cat is, is considered physiological, not physiological, but not co considered a disease, let's say, is called the dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So there is a, 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 a dynamic obstruction on the right ventricular outflow tract that usually is not very severe at all, does not require treatment and is benign. And we still cannot be sure if it's related or not with an underlying um, myopathy, okay? So usually it's seen as a, as a benign finding. Now, the clinical presentation is very different. So we can have obviously right side of congestive heart failure, which is quite rare because usually uh, right side of congestive heart congestive heart failure happens with arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is a quite rare condition that we di diagnose. However, we can see, have sometimes have like, you know, third degree AV blocks. We can also have, um, you know, uh, uh, tachyarrhythmias that eventually might push this patient to, um, uh, to the right side of congestive heart failure as well, but they are quite rare. But then we have left side of congestive heart failure, which is by far the most common presentation for a cat with a feline cardiomyopathy. Okay, we can have pulmonary edema, but now very important, we can also have pleural effusion. Okay, the particularity with the cats um, with uh, um, is that the, the the veins that drain the pleura, in fact, they drained in the in the pulmonary veins. So if we have congested pulmonary veins, we're going to have congestion as well in the pleural veins. So that's why cats can develop. A sign that in dogs is attributed to right side of congestive heart failure, but in 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 cats it can happen with left side uh, congestive heart failure as well. Okay, and obviously the typical clinical signs would be tachypnea, dyspnea, and now uh, there is a study as well um, done in UK that uh, show that in general practice up to 25% of the cats that present with heart failure with left side of congestive heart failure they can also have in the history uh, notes of being coughing as well. Okay, before the diagnosis of pulmonary edema, which is quite interesting because this is something that we didn't learn in bad school at all, or at least I didn't learn. We say that cough is most of the times, you know, airway, airway disease. And in fact, I also believe that I still think that a cough is mostly of the times associated with uh, airway disease in cats. Then we have the arterial uh, thromboembolism that I will discuss later on, and obviously sudden death. Okay, and sudden death, we think that might be because of ventricular fibrillation or even eventually a tiny clot that rather than going to the legs, it went to the brain. Okay, cool. So now what should we do then if we suspect that a particular patient has one of these feline cardiomyopathies? Okay, so we can perform echocardio. Echocardio will be the gold standard. He has two really big advantages apart from having a definitive diagnosis, okay? Uh, we can also already uh, screen for the left atrium enlargement. And why is that important? Because even if we take x-rays, okay? First, the x-rays cannot allow us to say, oh, this is an HCM, this is a restricted cardiomyopathy. It does not allow us to differentiate that. It does not allow us to assess systolic function as well. But uh, it only detects left atrial enlargement when it's quite already a, a quite chunky left atrium. So mild enlargement of the left atrium will not be detected by, by x-rays, okay? Uh, although x-rays remain a gold standard for pulmonary edema. And then we can have a several abnormalities on our ECG that might suggest that we might have uh, somehow, uh, you know, feline cardiomyopathy. But the problem here is, if we have them, yeah, we can suspect that we might have feline cardiomyopathy, but if, if we don't have it, we are in the same position. We are in, in point zero. So uh, the absence of these abnormalities on the CG does not rule out um, uh, feline cardiomyopathy, okay? So HCM on echo, okay? So uh, I will just turn on my pen now just to play the videos, okay? So we can have different types 
of presentation with HCM. We can have uh, a diffuse thickening um, of the wall, of the left ventricle. We can have more focal. Uh, we can have a diffuse but asymmetric. So all the walls are, are thickened, but they are kind of asymmetric. Um, but we can have different presentations. And unfortunately, this uh, presentation does not always correlate with the clinical signs, okay? We have walls that sometimes are just moderately thickened, and we have already a catastrophic cardiac remodeling of the left atrium. And we have also cases where we have a very thick left ventricle, but the left atrium is not as big, okay? Now, the diagnosis, um, everyone agrees that up to five millimeters um, of thickening of the left ventricular wall or septum in end diastole, up to five is okay. These patients do not have, um, you know, HCM. But uh, over six, uh, we all agree pretty much that, you know, that patient can be classified as having HCM. The problem here is between five and six. There is a gray area. There is a lot of debate. Um, with some people consider even higher than 5.5 already diagnostic for HCM. And the truth is we probably need to consider the body weight because it's very different if you consider a cat with three kilos and a cat with six or even nine. Okay, uh, because we, it's expectable that the, the wall thickening uh, will be higher in a, in, a, you know, you know, in a bigger cat. Okay, so maybe we need to consider a little bit in the future more the body weight. So, so I'll just complete these videos uh, for you, just obviously to show that this, this thickening is much more severe. Then look at this papillary muscle here, um, is um, uh, quite severe here. Look at this, okay. Um, and then, um, I will play these ones as well, just to show um, different degrees of thickening. And lo look at the, the, this one here, uh, where we have almost an obliteration of the mid ventricle, okay? Uh, look how thick these papillary muscles are. Okay, so these ones oh, you can measure, but you are already sure from what you are seeing, okay? Cool. And the problem with HCM is, is a diagnosis of exclusion. We have secondary cardiomyopathies that can mimic an HCM systemic hypertension and hyperthyroidism. And those ones can be partially reversible and maybe not, not progressive, okay? So uh, it's very important that when we see a thick ventricle, we should then measure blood pressure, just make sure that the patient is not hypertensive and definitely rule out uh, the total T4, particularly if we are speaking about cats older than, you know, um, eight years old, okay? But also you can also measure it in young, younger cats. Then we... I'm not sure if you can hear me now. I will just double check with. Um... Yes, you're back now. Thank you. Okay, Jonah. perfect. Okay, so I was I was saying that uh, um, um, we have another form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, that uh, um, where we have an obstruction. Okay, of the left ventricular outflow tract. Okay, that's why we call Occam hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Okay, what does it happen? We can have an obstruction of that outflow tract, uh, and because we have this obstruction, we can have uh, acceleration of the blood flow through that area, okay, which will be this area here, okay, um, okay. So that I will play the videos in a minute, but that would be basically the area of the outflow tract. This is a five chamber view, and the blood will flow faster, okay. And that can be for two reasons, okay. It can be because we have a septal bulge, so the area of the septum here is more thickened, okay, and narrows the outflow tract. And also we can have as well another role of something called systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, okay? Now, there is a lot of debate what happened to that valve, okay? But I will, I will play the video and I'll explain you what is the most believed mechanism at the moment, okay? So, um, so we can see that the, uh, the, the, you know, the mitral valve, which is this valve here. Okay, let me just play again. Okay, so this leaflet here is out touching the, the septum, is kind of being sucked or pushed toward the septum. And that will make this pattern when we have um, um, color Doppler applied. So you can see that uh, at this level, okay, um, we have turbulent flow, okay? is starting at this point. So that's the typical image with color Doppler that we get with this hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, okay? We have this turbulent flow because that area gets even more narrow when the mitral valve is being set to the outflow tract, okay? And then on M mode, we can see here as well um, that the, there is a, this little white line 
which is the septal lifetal being set back to the septum in systole, and obviously in systole that valve should be closed, okay? Um, and then on the um, uh, continuous wave Doppler, which is a way of assessing the, the velocities, we can have this shape. We call it Smita shape, okay? So look at this. So this is the normal profile. And then after this point, he has like a shape of a samurai sword or something like this. So where we can see acceleration of the blood flow. And that's because uh, after this point, the mitral valve is getting closer and closer and closer to the septum, and that, that area gets narrow and narrow, and the blood gets faster and faster. So that's why we have this, this area here. Now, I will stop the video just to show you what is the most um, uh, uh, likely um, uh, theory, basically, uh, that causes um, uh, this movement of the, uh, of the mitral valve. So it is believed Okay, that because of, of the hypertrophy, uh, the, there is uh, hypertrophy of the papillary muscles, they can get misaligned, they can have a more cranial displacement, okay, and that makes um, uh, basically the, the, the valve to be a, a, a little bit more, um, closing a little bit more further away from the mitral valve annulus, okay, so that makes the valve not adapting really at where it should be. So a little bit more cranial where it should be. So, okay, so more at this area. And because of the septal bulge, the blood, rather than following this path, it's believed that it's going, is pushed down to go around the septal bulge and then goes up. And when it goes up, it can lift the, the, the mitral valve against the septum. And therefore it can cause us this, um, this uh, motion of the mitral valve. So that's Occam, this is in people is, is associated with a negative prognosis, okay? Not in cats at the moment, okay? Now, let me just remove my laser again. And then we have the recific cardiomyopathy, okay? We have the two forms, which I already discussed with you before. I'll not go with you uh, again through that, but just let you know that on, on, um, on echo, we should have uh, something called restrictive uh, filling pattern, which I will mention, I'll show you a picture later on, we should not have a thickening uh, of the ventricle. So you should have normal thickness, normal systolic function. And usually we have severe atrial enlargement, either the left atrium only or by, uh, by atrial enlargement. So both atria, okay? So I'll show you this image as well, um, where we have um, uh, basically these two videos to show you um, basically this area here. Can you see how bright this is? This is, is the endocardial uh, fibrosis, okay. Um, okay. Is it back, Anna? Yes, that's all back okay, now. I think okay. one video at a time. I think, yeah, one video at a time. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank good. you. Okay, so um, what I was trying to say, I was trying to play both videos because otherwise I'll need to go back with uh, my uh, laser all the time. So basically, I will show you, I'll show you that, can you see this bright area here? Okay, that's basically fibrosis of the endo endocardial layer, which is a, this, this is the first form I, I mentioned to you before, the endomyocardial form when we have a really marked fibrosis uh, on, the, on the endocardial layer, okay? And on this one, I'll play later on the video, you can see already here, there is a connection, this is a, this is a bridging scar connecting the left ventricle free wall to the septum, okay? This is just to show really that obviously we don't have thickening of the wall, okay? We have also, um, um, you know, uh, a normal systolic function. And here is what I used to call, um, or I call before basically a restrictive uh, pattern of the mitral, uh, mitral inflow, okay? So basically we are measuring the velocities of the blood flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And you can see that there is a very tall wave. It's called E wave, that represents the early filling okay, of the ventricle. And you have a very tiny, tiny, tiny yellow wave here that's called the A wave. So the ratio in terms of velocity between these two waves is higher than two, okay? That means that we have a restricting pattern, okay? It means that that ventricle is really, really stiff, okay? So I'll play the videos now, okay? So, uh, just for you to see a little better these, uh, the, these bright areas representing the endocardial um, um, scar, okay? And then these bridging fibrosis that I was mentioning to you before, that in fact, you can see a little bit of turbulent flow, a little bit of flash flow there, that is the uh, uh, a mid ventricular obstruction. Okay, and here is just to show that uh, you know the the ventricle um, is not thickened. Okay, um, so so that will be a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay, now we can also have the DCM phenotype, and I call it phenotype because we don't 
tend to have the genetic DCM uh, in cats. So we usually, if you have a DCM phenotype, we are dealing either with a very, very end stage uh, cardiomyopathy or with a nutritional cardiomyopathy. We can also have other kind of, uh, you know, myopathy. I'll connect again. Yep, we've got yep, you. Yep, Thanks, perfect. Joel. So yeah, the DCM phenotype, I was saying that is mostly the nutritional, okay? So, and you can see that there is a, a, a also a systolic dysfunction here um, where we have a very uh, wide and dilated uh, left ventricle with very poor fractional shortening, which suggests a very poor systolic um, uh, function. And then we have the ARVC. See, these are not uh, uh, um, uh, videos, they are still images, because I want to use these images just to point out that the right side is dilated. So it should not be as big as these. Okay, look at this side. This is a short axis view where we have a very big uh, cap of uh, right ventricle that is very dilated on top of a very small left ventricle. On the M mode, it's quite difficult for us to see a lot of times the, you know, the, um, the right ventricle cavity and look how easy it is to be, we can see it here. Um, and then finally, this is a, a, the, the right atrium tricuspid valve here, right ventricle there, and look how dilated the the, the, um, this right side um, is. And another characteristic of this condition is that the right ventricle becomes quite thin, okay? The right ventricle free wall he, here, it becomes quite thin. And then obviously be, before we move on, I don't have uh, images here, but the, these other cardiomyopathies called non-specific cardiomyopathies that don't fit with any of these criteria that I just mentioned for these conditions. Now, if we are in a preclinical stage, which, which kind of treatment we should be doing, okay? So at the moment, we don't have evidence to use uh, AC inhibitors in the preclinical stage, okay? So we don't tend to use AC inhibitors. Um, diltiazem used to be used in the past, but not anymore, okay? So we don't have a really strong evidence to say that it does not work, uh, but we also not have a strong evidence to say that it works. So it's not used anymore. Um, Pimovendan can be used only if we are dealing with an DCM uh, case or a case with a very marked systolic uh, dysfunction for whatever the reason is, usually secondary feline cardiomyopathies. And then beta blockers, um, uh, obviously uh, it makes sense to use them in obstructive cases, when in, in these hypertrophic obstructive cases to decrease obstruction because we are decreasing the contractility that eventually will help in not pushing the mitral valve leaflets so close to the septum. So um, the problem is that we have a study not a super strong study, but that study shows that there is no benefit in the survival uh, if we use atenolol in those cases, okay? And it also shows that we don't have uh, an improvement in quality of life as well. So uh, some cardiologists they use, sometimes uh, they don't, depends on the cardiologist, okay? And then we have the high-risk cats, the ones that are in the stage B2, as we discussed in the beginning. Those cats definitely need uh, action, okay? We need to start clopidogrel um, uh, and based on a, a study that is the fat cat study, the fat cat study compared to pedigree and aspirin, but to prevent recurrence of a thrombus, not to prevent the primary thrombus. Okay. However, the consensus that we have available use that study to extrapolate and saying we should probably using uh, clopidogrel as well to pr prevent the primary thrombus, the very very first event. Okay. So. Cats with a moderate to, in, to severe enlargement of the left atrium, we should be using clopidogrel to prevent the thrombus. Then there are also uh, now these drugs called rivaroxaban, which I think will be uh, uh, probably the future of uh, thrombophylaxis. Um, and we know that if you combine rivaroxaban with clopidogrel, we should not have a lot of side effects. Um, there is a study that's called a supercat study um, that is also uh, comparing now um, uh, uh, both both drugs, so clopidogrel and rivaroxaban, to see whether we have any any uh, benefit uh, higher with one than with another one. Okay. Now let's assume that we sp we spoke about the preclinical therapy, and now let's assume we have a, a clinical presentation. Okay, we have a cat that has um, uh, dyspnea and is presenting to us uh, with this kind of breathing. Okay, so slow but with effort, okay? Or a cat that open mouth breathing and panting like this, or, or very tachypneic pretty much, okay? So what do we need to do? Okay, our main issue is always, is it heart failure or is it a respiratory problem? 
Okay, and usually we don't have a lot of time to decide because it's an emergency situation and cats can be quite fragile when they become like that. Okay, so we need to know first whether it's a congestive heart failure, which is in fact the most common reason. But if you notice, 37% of the cases in dyspnea in UK a long time ago in a study that was done were represented 37% of those cases. And then respiratory disease also represented quite a big chunk of cases, 32. So our aim is to try to say, is it respiratory or is it heart failure? Okay, and then if it's heart failure, is it pulmonary edema? or it is pleural effusion because our approach to, uh, to stabilize this patient will be different, okay? But uh, our main goals, regardless, will be stabilize, give oxygen, sedation, if needed, because uh, most of the times they are quite uh, anxious in the practice which can, which can make everything worse, okay? And then if we have pulmonary edema, definitely furosemide. If we have an effusion, pleural effusion, definitely um, we need to drain it, okay? So how do we decide if it's respiratory or heart? So rats is are definitely the best way, okay? So if you have pleural effusion, that's very unlikely that is a respiratory problem, okay? Because the most common cause for pleural effusion in cats is in fact heart disease. Now, the problem with the rats is that is a, a lot of times they are so stressed, it is difficult to, you know, to make them lying down in a nice position. I used to, a long time ago, I used to put them in a, in, in a, in a box, in a, you know, basically in a, in a crate and go to the x-rays Hopefully they will be internal and I take an x-ray and just to show whether it's really a lot of effusion or not. So now we have a little bit better tools that can help us as well to tell us if, a, if a cat is dyspneic or not because of heart disease. Okay, so it's a very good idea to have in, have in general practice or particularly if you don't have an echo machine available to have the, the snap, depth for, and the snap test for ProBNP. Okay, and the main thing is if it's positive, the specificity is not super high, but if it's negative, it's very unlikely that the, this dyspnea is because of heart disease, okay? So that can be quite handy. And then we have the echo, okay? We can, we can always do a quick T-fast, okay? To check a few things. And the most easy thing to check is the left atrium, okay? So because you can do it standing or you can just lie down for a little bit if you, are, if you prefer lying down. But we know that if you have a LAO, Okay, okay, the ratio between basically the left atrium, okay, and uh, um, so, sorry, the left atrium here, okay, and the aorta, okay, if it's bigger than 1.8 or 2, depending on the study, there is a very high risk of uh, heart failure. So, if combining that risk with the dyspnea that we are seeing, then we are quite confident that we are dealing with a, with a you know, a left sided congestive heart failure case. We can also measure in the long axis, okay, uh, the LA max, okay, the uh, left atrial maximal dimension, which is from here up to there. And if it's higher than 18, 19, it's been suggested that we are dealing with a patient with a very high risk of pulmonary, pulmonary edema or even pleural effusion. And therefore, if you have combination of dyspnea with that measurement, then we are kind of confident as well, okay, that we are dealing with a, a cardiac case rather than a, a respiratory case. And then you can do all the other fancy things. So you can do the mitral inflow that we just show an image before for the restricted cardiomyopathy. And if it's higher than 1.8, that's also just suggestive of uh, uh, you know, uh, high left-sided feeling pressures. And then with this study as well, more recently, that suggested that if we have um, uh, the sum of the EA velocity, okay, dividing by the sum of the EA prime, which is something the more advanced, you need to do tissue Doppler imaging, but if it's a cutoff, higher than 15.1, it's also suggestive of um, underlying uh, heart disease that probably is the cause for the dyspnea. Okay, so, um, so we are happy to go ahead and then speak about x-rays. Okay, so x-rays, I was telling you that can be very helpful. Obviously, if we have x-rays like these, we are pretty much sure there's not a respiratory problem. That's uh, definitely a, a cardiac problem. So, or, or at least more likely to be a cardiac problem because obviously another differentials be, you know, lymphoma, uh, FIP, you know, but the most common cause for, uh, for pleural fusion is definitely heart disease. Now, the rats can be useful, okay? Most of the times a single view is enough because I, as I said, it, it can be quite stressful for these patients that have heart dyspnea. And we, we usually with the pleural fusion, we see this elevation of the lung fields. Uh, you know, we cannot see very well the borders of the heart. Look at this dorsal ventral view where we can have this one lung lobe here, another one there, and you can see a tiny, tiny line there, which is called pleural, um, pleural fissure line, basically, okay? So that means that we have fluid between two lung lobes. Um, so 
so that can be very helpful, but we also can use something that is quite easy, which is a TFAST. Okay, TFAST, they can do external, less stressful than X-rays, and you can see right away the amount of uh, pleural fluid that, that you can have there. Now, if you have a pleural fusion, definitely we, the first thing we need to do is to drain it, okay? And most of the times you don't need like a, a strong sedation, and I tend to use a butterfly. Um, obviously you need to clip the area, make it aseptic. I usually use the intercostal space seven to nine, ideally, I mean, if we have echo to guide us where we're going to insert our needle or our butterfly needle, that's perfect. If not, you can try to do it blind in that area. And obviously, the thing that fluid usually with gravity, if it's internal, goes down. So if you go down, it will be safer. We will not be eating a lung uh, um, and it will be more close to the uh, big pockets of fluid. Uh, the only thing here is if you don't have an immediate improvement, think twice. Think, is it I didn't drain enough or is it any other complication? Because maybe on the first time, I stick a needle my, on my, in the lung and now we have a pneumothorax, okay? Or we have an hemorrhage, um, okay? And another thing is, there is a suggestion from some cardiologists that we need to be careful when we have chronic pleural effusions that we might not, uh, it might be dangerous to drain all the, all the pleural effusion. I don't think this is like, is, 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 there is a, 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 some debate about this. I spoke already a few cardiologists, they don't agree completely, but to just let you know what is the perspective of, the, of those people that believe that we need to be careful of, with the amount that we drain. The theory is if we have a chronic effusion, you can have like a, a pleural fibrosis of the visceral pleura, okay? And when we drain a lot, the expansion of the lungs, okay, that then been non-retractable for a while, it can rupture the, the visual pleura and we can end up with a pneumothorax, okay? So that's the theory behind it. However, I, to be honest with you, I still tend to, to drain as much as I can if possible. Then pulmonary edema is the, it's easy to diagnose with x-rays if it's a lot. Okay, if it's a lot, we can have a different types of presentation. That's a problem that we have with cats in dogs. We have the very ileal cauda dorsal. In cats, again, they do whatever they want. They can have everywhere. They can have a diffuse pattern um, that is non-uniform, uniform, a multifocal one. Okay, I will show you here another one. Um, uh, let me just change. To, okay, so an, another type of you know, different presentation uh, where you can see a diffuse, but here is more alveolar and here is more interstitial maybe, a multifocal one as well. Um, so the problem with cats is if he's very severe, it's easy. But if he's very mild and just, uh, you know, just starting with an interstitial pattern, it can be sometimes quite difficult to differentiate from, for instance, um, uh, airway disease, because we, go, we also know that feline asthma can give you a little bit of interstitial pattern. So when is, when is borderline, when it's very just starting, it can be sometimes difficult. And that's why the TFAST can be quite helpful. Then it also allow us to you know, see where we have distended veins or a big left atrium as well. Although when you have this pattern, it's kind of difficult to assess the size of the left atrium. I have here some examples for you just to see, okay? So um, this is just a progression how how big the left atrium can be seen on X-ray. So normal, a little bit dilated, uh, and then you can see this curvature is getting bigger and bigger. And now we have this valentine heart on the dorsal ventral, which a lot of times we assume that was because of biatrial dilation, but in fact is uh, mostly due to the left atrium dilation that can look like that, okay? Again, X-rays will only detect significant uh, or be quite obvious with a significant uh, enlargement of the left atrium. The mild cases we might not be able to detect. TFAST to check the B-lines, it can be also quite handy, particularly if you have a big left atrium. So if you have checking and you see a lot of B-lines in the same place or in different places, and together with that, we have a big left atrium, then obviously we are more likely to be with a pulmonary edema of cardiogenic origin. And then how do we address pulmonary edema? So we discuss perfusion. How do I do with pulmonary edema, okay? First things first, oxygen and sedation, okay? This cat will be anxious in, a, in a, um, basically in our, our um, uh, clinic, in our hospital. And they usually can, I mean, look at how poorly this cat, he, look at the effort is with a, uh, uh, with a mask there, but ideally it should uh, be um, uh, there in our oxygen cage. And why I put this picture? Because can you see here, the temperature and the humidity, okay? So it's very important for us to control the temperature of, of the cage because otherwise, look at this, 25 degrees is quite a lot. Uh, it's probably 
hotter inside than outside. So we need to be careful because otherwise it can get even more, you know, tachypneic with a, with a warm environment, okay? Um, key drug, definitely for us, might. IV, in, if possible, uh, otherwise we're gonna give the first injection IM or even subcut, and then we carry on with IV as soon as we can fit an IV line. And I don't have a fixed fix protocol. I have cats that I give it once or twice in a day, and they go home. And I have cats that can be hospitalized for a few days. You know, so it depends on the initial response. It depends on whether they have seen frosmide, whether they are now becoming resistant. So it depends on a lot of things. Okay. But my main approach is most of the times is one to two milligram per kilo in the first, you know, as soon as I have seen this cat and I believe that his heart, the problem, and then I give it every hour one milligram per kilo until I do see an improvement. Okay. If I don't see an improvement, I start to wonder whether I, I got wrong the diagnosis or if, if there is something else, okay, particularly if this cat has never seen frosmide in his life. Okay. Now, another, another important thing that I'd like to discuss with you is that we need to take, if possible, baseline bloods because the kidney values will go high. Urea, creatinine, okay, lights can, you know, can change as well. We can have hypokalemia and we have here in a good example of a cat that arrived already hypokalemic. Okay, because it was already on first mind. Um, so look at the ventral flexion of this neck. So you need to address that. Okay, and it can be quite tricky because if you want to address fast, you can. You need to give a bit of fluid with a potassium supplementation, which is something you don't want to do. Okay, in a cat in our failure. Now, although some cardiologists use AC inhibitors in an acute setting, I don't tend to use it. And the reason for that is because we are quite being quite aggressive already. We know that frosmide itself will make the kidney's values to go higher. And AC inhibitors, the benefit of them You're back now, Anna? thanks. Yes. We can hear can you. Hear? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So Thank I was going, I was saying the AC inhibitors um, are you know, they are more long-term benefits. So they don't really act on as an emergency situation as you'd like to, unfortunately. So on top of this, they do uh, a preferential vasodilation of the afferent artery. So they can, in fact, uh, uh, decrease the GFR. So, uh, and that's why when we are quite aggressive with frosamide, and because the benefit I will get with them is probably more long-term, uh, I will probably not do not give them in a, an acute setting. I will give them uh, uh, um, when they go home. And even now there is a massive discussion whether they are even useful in cats or not. So, so I definitely don't use in acute setting. And definitely monitor the, the breathing rate to adjust diuresis, okay? So just to see whether um, uh, we need to increase the frosmide, we can already decrease the frosmide. Now, pimovendan. A pimovendan is useful in when we have systolic dysfunction, like a DCM phenotype in stage disease. It can be quite uh, uh, handy in these situations. Okay, um, and clopidogrel only started when you the cat can hit, or when if you feel comfy that uh, if you're going to peel it, uh, uh, is not going to cause even extra stress in a cat that is already breathing quite badly. But as soon as you can, you can start clopidogrel because you know, is, is in failure, he has a big left atrium, so you can start, is one of the criteria to start um, um, grill. And then full echo is not important. It will not change so much what you're gonna do on the first hours, but it's important to stabilize the patient. And then later on, yes, we can do a full echo. The charge, once the breathing rate is better, okay, stable, I don't wait for the 30, 35 uh, breaths per minute in the hospital. I usually wait up to when they reach 40 because they are already, you know, they are not asleep, they are anxious. So if a breathing rate is 40 around the hospital without effort, okay, without effort, I'm happy to discharge those patients. And I tend to discharge those patients with a higher dose of rosemide because I prefer like that. And then eventually over the next week or two weeks, win off. Um, the frosmide until I get the minimal effective dose, okay? Always with the monitoring of the breathing rate at home to monitor those things. And obviously the cats that are very, you know, you have a cat that came in with a breathing rate of 80, he only dropped to 60 and it's still quite high for you to discharge, but he's a stressy cat. So take an x-rays and so you can definitely prove he can go home because sometimes they breathe faster and the edema is not there anymore just because they are anxious. Now, acute arterial thromboembolism, okay, is basically, um, um, uh, you know, an uh, horrible outcome for a feline cardiomyopathy, okay? So we know that we have a large um, left atrium as a 
uh, you know, as a, one of the most important predisposing factors because it can cause blood stasis. We can see the smoke, which you can see this smoke here on, on this on this. I'll see if um, Anna can hear me again. Yeah, we can Anna hear, can you, hear me again. You. Okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, so, no if, uh, um, so if so uh, if uh, the, the localization of the clot is mostly uh, uh, on the tip of the left auricular appendage, okay, you can see one here. I'll play the video, okay. And obviously here we have a, a very nice video. I'll show you in a minute. Um, so you can see smoke and the clot on on the tip, okay. On this one, you can see the clot moving around, okay. A very large clot. Okay, cool. So what are the clinical signs? The clinical signs are basically that, paralysis, okay? Usually associated with a horrible pain that usually lasts 12 to 20, 24 hours because then we lose the sensory receptors most of the times. But you can have seen paralysis that can be unilateral, bilateral. Usually the tail, the tail carry on moving in, in, in most of the cases, okay? Uh, we have um, basically uh, weak femoral pulses. Uh, we have caudal um, limbs that are a little bit cold to the touch, okay? And you have, as you can see on this image here with uh, these paws, you can see that the left one is more cyanotic than the, the right one, okay? You can see also those signs. And obviously quite painful limbs, particularly if, if it's an acute episode and it's quite, a, a, you know, a big obstruction. And they get quite firm uh, limbs as well. So flaccid paralysis is not, is not usually classic for arter arterial thromboembolism, okay? So these are the main clinical signs. Um, so the diagnosis is basically history and physical exam, as we have seen. We can use blood glucose um, to compare, let's say, you know, uh, an affected member. Okay, uh, let's say the affected limb. You know, the the you know the right. Let's say the right is affected. You can take bloods from the right uh, saphenous, for instance, and then you can compare to the you know to the front one or even to the contralateral one. Okay, and if it has been suggested that if you have a glucose levels um, difference higher than 1.7, that can suggest that in fact, we have a, 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 an arterial thromboembolism there. The only thing is that cutoff has been suggested from a study where there is no doubt that those cats have an arterial thromboembolism. So we don't know if this can apply for cats where they are, we are not so sure about that. Okay, so be, be, bear that in mind. Echo is definitely recommended to try to understand whether, you know, it's definitely a thromboembolism or not, because you need to see, you know, at least the predisposing factors. So a big left atrium, smoke, eventually a clot. CK can be helpful as well, because we know that once we have a thromboembolism, we can have, a, um, you know, a, 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 a very high increase in CK. So if we don't have a very high increase in CK, an arterial thromboembolism, it's more unlikely. And then we can definitely do uh, total T4 because we can have uh, arterial thromboembolism with hyperthyroidism, okay? And obviously check for pulmonary edema because some of these cases also present with pulmonary edema, okay? Despite being presenting with, you know, with a, with a femoral art arterial thromboembolism, they can also be with in edema at that moment. So treatment-wise, there is not a really absolute center of care, unfortunately, okay? There is a few things quite new recently, and that might be worth to mention, but at the moment we still not have an absolute standard of care, okay? The cornerstone is definitely pain relief. They, it's very important to, you know, um, to control pain um, in, in these patients. We can use anticoagulation, okay? We can, I prefer the low molecular weight heparin, okay? To, uh, and this is not going to dissolve the clot. It's going to basically prevent a bigger clot where the clot that is, uh, is blocking the blood flow is Okay, so it prevents this clot to get even bigger. Uh, and definitely very important is the clopidogrel uh, plus minus aspirin. The clopidogrel is an antiplatelet drug and also prevents the release of serotonin. Serotonin is something that is released by the platelets in these cases and will cause vasoconstriction um, on the muscle. And that's why we, we don't have um, you know, collateral, collateral circulation and we have ischemic cardiomyopathy. And th that's why copidogrel can be important because it, it blocks also this release of serotonin, which can be quite handy as well. Okay. So definitely I start clopidogrel um, on the day one. I tend to use on the day one. Um, and obviously the cat needs to be, you know, uh, amenable to pill, obviously, because he might not eat because he's in pain. Uh, I tend to use a, a loading dose. So I don't start with a standard dose of 18.75 because it takes two or three days to be 
achieve, to achieve uh, okay, good levels uh, in the serum, okay, in, in the blood serum. So I tend to use uh, those of 75. And then on the next day, okay, because this drug is once daily, on the next day, I go down to the normal dose of 18.75. We know now that thrombolytic treatment is not superior and in fact is not being recommended anymore, okay? Um, and there is a study that suggests that we should try all these 72 hours of hospitalization, okay? And try just to see whether we can get any kind of improvement and at least control pain. Uh, I have to be honest with you, you know, depending on the referral practice, I, it's quite difficult sometimes to keep them for 70, 72 hours um, and, uh, and sometimes 48 hours, that's probably what I try to do as well, at least. Complications that should be discussed with the owner, even sometimes before we admit the patient or to, uh, you know, to our, um, you know, uh, ICU care or, uh, you know, or to our hospital. Basically, ischemia, okay, or we're going to have ischemia of the skin. Look, we're going to get necrosis on, in this area uh, of the skin. This is an example, okay, and, and reperfusion injury, which can happen 40 to 70% of the cases. And if, when it happens, survival rates as low as zero to 40%. So quite nasty, okay? And that happens because suddenly that uh, blockage caused by the clot, okay, by the thrombus um, gets uh, dissolved, okay, or, or goes somewhere else. And then suddenly uh, we have all these hyperkalemia and uh, toxic metabolites that can go back into circulation. And usually it's, it's quite nasty, okay? It's, it's gonna be quite difficult to handle. So, so these are the main complications. And prognosis, if we want to keep some kind of info to the owner, having the prognosis with the, on the day of the admission, we can say if the patient is bradycardic, hypothermic, without any motor function or in failure, that is a negative prognostic indicator. And obviously, if you have two limbs rather than one limb affected, it's also worse um, okay, for this patient. I tend to use two studies to tell some information for the owner, for them to decide whether they want to carry on or even consider euthanasia, okay? The first one is quite scary, okay? Which is a, a study done in UK where it shows that only 27% of the cats survived in general practice the first 24 hours. From the ones, um, you know, from the ones that uh, survived, 55 or 56% died in the first seven days, okay? So quite a, a big amount of cats. The ones that survive the seven days, 45% have recur recurrence of the thrombus. Okay, um, and the medium survival time for those that survived the first week was only around three months. And 2.5%, okay, so six of the 250 cats were alive after one year. Okay, so a small percentage. So that's, that's gonna be quite scary. But I also mentioned the fat cat study because the fat cat study, although only included cats that survived the first event, Okay, so we not include the ones that don't not, didn't survive the first episode. It showed that if they survive the first event, okay, rather than living just three months, as another study was suggesting, okay, if they were on clopidogrel afterwards, they have a, a median time to recurrence or cardiac death of almost a an year. Okay, so it's a bit more positive. Okay, so it's good to get, give this information to the owner. And then let's assume that we have an heart failure patient we stabilize the patient and now needs to go home, okay? So he's, go, he's moved from a stage B2, let's say, okay, to the stage C. So the chronic therapy will be based basically on, on this. Frosmite, clopidogrel, okay? Monitoring the breathing rate at home, at sleep or resting, very, very important, okay? And also the renal function. So again, I mentioned with you before, the AC inhibitors are not, you know, you know super, um, uh, uh, helpful, and now, now there are studies that show that there is no benefit in giving them in cats. So if the owner can afford, you can eventually suggest that because of the theoretical benefits, but if it cannot afford, if the cat is difficult to peel, this is the one to go away, okay? This is the one to not give. Pimo Benden, unfortunately, I was quite, uh, uh, you know, hoping that Pimo Benden would be another kind of nice drug to use. And there was a few studies in the past that suggested if they could uh, increase survival, but there is a recent study that said basically they then make a big difference. However, this study includes recent heart failure patients. I tend to use more in advanced uh, heart failure, um, uh, uh, HCM, uh, and restricted cardiomyopathy. I don't tend to use in, uh, as soon as they develop heart failure. So it might be that pimobendin can be helpful in later stages. Taurin, obviously, if he's a, a DCM patient, okay, with a, even if you don't measure taurin, 
uh, to prove that it's taurine deficient, you, can, you should supplement it with taurine just in case. But, uh, uh, but obviously, if you have proven taurine deficiency, definitely su supplement with taurine. And it's, it's very rare nowadays anyway. Potassium supplementation, for sure, okay, if there is a, a, a proven hypokalemia. And then reassessments every two, every four months, um, okay, and justify the owner why we need those, okay, just obviously to, to adjust. And the truth is, if the owner is quite, you know, quite compliant, we don't need to do as often, but you know, if it's not as compliant, it might be worth to check every, every two to four months. And then stage D, okay, quite um, uh, uh, you know, sad stage because it's, it's already last resource thing. And, uh, and that, that's the recommendations of the consensus, okay? So we can start spinolactone, um, okay, eventually. Uh, and then if there is any kind of degree of systolic dysfunction, which is quite common with the uh, final stages of, of HCM or even restricted cardiomyopathy, uh, definitely you, the owners will always ask if they should give you know a specific diet, you know low sodium. I always give priority to the color intake rather than sodium restriction because one of the most negative pronostics, uh, okay, in people, okay, for sure, and also in, in our pets is weight loss, okay. So uh, and therefore it's better for them to eat rather than having a super restricted diet to not have any kind of, uh, uh, you know, even mild, moderate levels of sodium. And then obviously explain to donors that these patients will need close monitoring with, a, uh, with a, you know, uh, of the urea creatinine. They are expected to go high, um, you know, as far as the patient is uh, asymptomatic for the azotemia, we are happy with that. Once they are in the minimal effective dose and are already symptomatic for the stemia, I think we are starting to have difficult conversations with owners by then. And finally, I think this is the last slide. Okay, so this is just you know some negative pronostic indicators for mainly for HCM. That uh, there's some most of the studies is for HCM really. So if you have an gallop, an arrhythmia. Uh, you know, a very large left atrium, uh, uh, a very low fractional shortening of the left ventricle, or even the left atrium has been suggested as one of the most important uh, pronostic indicators. A smoke, um, or even a, a, a you know a very very extreme hypertrophy, or sometimes we have like myocardial death, and then is replaced by scar tissue, which looks like a very thin very thin ventricle. These are all negative pronostic indicators. And this is the, the survival time, so it's for you to have an idea in case owners ask you, okay? So HCM combined with the congestive heart failure, you can have a very big range of survival, uh, you know, between three months and these 563 days, okay? So I, I honestly, I also say this to donors, and I've seen cats with HCM dying much sooner than three months, okay? But I definitely have seen a lot of cats that I don't believe they were living more than a an year, and they managed to do it. And then restricted cardiomyopathy and congestive heart failure has been suggested uh, around 60 days. There is a study that suggests much more than that, but that includes asymptomatic and symptomatic cases. So uh, for symptomatic cases, that's a study that suggests just two months, which is kind of what probably I do see in practice. Okay, cool. Okay, so thank you so much for your, your help. Um, I'm sorry for this. Uh, these uh, you know cuts on my internet. I think somehow you know it's quite fast internet, but I think sometimes the, the line might be a little bit unstable and just cut out. But at least I didn't. I was not logged out completely from the from the call. And no, I'm more no, than happy. I'm more than yeah. happy. To, sorry, Anna. I was saying I was more than happy to uh, to answer now some questions that you might have as well. Thanks, Joelle. And yes, apologies for any of the technical issues we had. I think it's all the gamers and Netflix series after work that's. Um, yeah hugging the hugging the internet for us this evening so thank you for using yours to join us today um so we have had a few questions come through and please do um, continue to send those in to yep. us um so we have a question from norbert he asks um regarding restrictive cardiomyopathy is it age dependent or are the chances to develop the disease increase um as the cat gets older yeah, I do see. I, I do see. I do. I, it's true, a good question. I do tend to see them in more older cats, and I, I think they tend to happen in old cats. But I don't think we have like a study looking into that uh, epidemiology. But uh, that's we definitely. If my experience is to send in older cats, the problem that we have. I mean, this is obviously. Uh, with this could be another hour of discussion. Is that the problem? Is that a lot of times these restricted cardiomyopathies we don't even know if they represent an end stage cardiomyopathy, where we have this thinning, I was telling you, so that initially the left ventricle is quite thick, and then it gets thin, 
okay? Um, and they look like unrestricted chymopathy, okay? So, so sometimes you don't even know if that's the case. Uh, and if we put uh, two hearts uh, to, for a cardiac pathologist, you know, a post-mortem, even themselves being specialists, they don't agree sometimes where they should call HCM or even restricted chymopathy. So maybe our, the, one of the reasons why you see them, you know, uh, you know, in older cats, maybe this is just a, um, uh, a end, more a ending stage of, uh, of an HCM case maybe, but I do tend them in older cats for sure. Lovely, thank you. Uh, we have another question that's just come in. Um, how do you treat left ventricular obstructive outflow tract? Okay, good, very good question. So, um, what is been, if I need to treat an, uh, an obstruction, okay, of the left ventricle flow tract, I do tend to use atenolol, okay? Now, one very important thing to mention is there is a study that I mentioned before that, uh, as I said, it, it does not increase survival. And, and the study also showed that it does not increase quality of life, okay? Now, my experience, and this is, uh, is going to be my experience, and I think it's been some of other colleagues, okay, is that when you have a very severe okay, uh, obstruction. And, and sometimes the owners report, oh, he's a bit quiet, he's a very lethargic cat, okay? And I do honestly think that sometimes atenolol can make a difference. Atenolol is used in, in, in people with HCM, with an obstructive form, to, uh, you know, in people that have angina pain. Now, we don't know if cats have angina pain, and that study shows, in fact, that does not increase uh, quality of life. But honestly, I have cases where I try the tenolol and the owner, you know, which is a negative inotrope and then an, uh, uh, an, an a neg negative chronotrope, so it will decrease the, you know, the heart rate and the, and the systolic function and the conductility. And basically, um, that would expect them to become more lethargic eventually. But in fact, those cases get much more brighter and more active. So maybe that was the obstruction that was causing the lethargy and I kind of elevate obstruction, they get better. So I think that in some cases, if they are symptomatic or if we do suspect they are symptomatic, we can use a tenolol to try, at least try. And then, and then if it doesn't work, if you don't see a difference, then eventually you can decide whether you can, can just carry on or take it out, uh, depending on the kind of owner you have and how easy it is to peel the cat. But I honestly believe that in, if you have an obstruction that is mild, I don't treat. If it's moderate, I don't treat, unless there is clinical signs that I think might be attributed to that. If it's severe, I tend to treat even, even in sometimes in some cases where I don't think they are symptomatic. I try and wait mm. for the owner feedback to say whether, oh, suddenly, uh, I thought it was always like this for a while, and now suddenly it's much active since the tenolol. It happened several times already with my cases. Okay, thank you, Joelle. Yeah. Um, we have another question um, uh, regarding rivavaxan. Am I pronouncing uh, it correctly? Yeah. Sorry, Riva, for from yeah. So, so I think rivaroxaban we is um, is a question regarding whether I use it or not. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, are you using it for prevention of a thrombus? Yes, so that's a good question. I don't use as a first line, okay? Um, but either, either case, this is a very nice. So at the moment, we don't know yet versus completely well whether it's better or not. However, uh, not in a cat species, either a case with a really, really big thrombus on a, an opacemaker lead. And we decided, we decided to use rivaroxaban on that case. And I saw the follow-up and there was no thrombus at all, not at all. And I, I thought that was so impressive that I start to use it more and more now in cats. So um, uh, at once you get question is, I tend to use clopidogrel as a first line. Uh, if the patient recurs, I use rivaroxaban. But if you ask my opinion, I think in the future we might, I don't know the results yet of the study and hopefully, hopefully it will show that rivaroxaban is better than clopidogrel um, because at least we already know that together, I think there was this study where only five out of 130 cats had side effects that don't even require hospitalization. So okay. we can use together, we can use them together. But I think in the future, maybe we're gonna say that rivaroxaban might be better than clopidogrel. Let's wait for, for, the, for that study. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, we've got some more questions coming in actually. Yes. So should we be recommending cardiac workup on every cat we see with a heart murmur? So, um, I think the right, I will say, I think the right answer is probably yes. And, uh, but the question is, so the, just for, uh, just for, in terms of follow-up really, the question is if there is a heart murmur, and as, as we said, a lot of them, they are functional. So it is no problem, 
but if there is a heart murmur, it should ideally be sophisticated because if there is HCM, we need to know which stage they are, if they are in stage B1 or B2, because if they are in stage B2, we can act on it. Yeah. If there was nothing that we could have done at all in the preclinical stage, probably there was no point. We would just wait for the clinical signs to appear. But now we, we, there is a recommendation that we should uh, act on the stage B2, and the only way of knowing is to scan them. The mm -hmm. problem is that I also said that if we don't have, if the cats cannot have, can have a really bad heart disease without a murmur, but then in that situation, we, we cannot scan all the cats. So, but yeah, I, I think definitely, I usually say, I usually think to myself, if it was my cat, would I scan him? And I would say definitely for sure. Yeah. So in an ideal world, if there's yeah, a murmur, yeah, we want yeah. to know if it's, yeah. um, if we need to yeah. intervene yeah. or not. And, and, and you can use the pro anti pro NP or, or even troponin, if he's high, it's easy to yeah. convince the owner. The problem is that if they are negative, it does not mean that there's no heart disease. Okay. Mm. Unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Roger has asked, are there proven benefits of tyrosamide over furosemide uh, in cats? Uh, no, at the moment, no. However, um, however, I don't think there is a, a, you know, a, a study that shows definitely this better. We definitely have studies in dogs, okay, that says that tyrosamide is not inferior to, to tyrosamide and it can be even used as a first line. Now, if you ask my experience, I do tend to use furosemide. Now, Mm -hmm. There are two situations where I tend to use them slightly earlier than the refractory stage, let's say. So in theory, when we go to the refractory stage, you know, when we have high dose of, of furosemide, maybe we need to consider to swap it to tyrosamide. I have two situations why I tend to use tyrosamide sooner, okay? One is the compliance. I think compliance is definitely super important. So if we have a owner that is struggling to give the, this third dose of uh, furosemide in the afternoon, I prefer to use tyrosamide. Second is the ones that have right-sided congestive heart failure. So right-sided congestive heart failure are the ones that have a gut congestion, okay? So you already have a, a, a poor absorption of the diuretic there. And, and tyrosamide is more bioavailable. So I would do use in those cases sooner because I, I, do, I used to get better results. I don't see them so much now anymore, but, but when I was in Liverpool, I used to see quite a few cats with a, a arrhythmogenic um, right Sorry, I think we've lost you there, Joelle. Just wait for a moment while Joelle's internet uh, yeah. comes back. Yeah. Okay, yeah, you're back now. Thank you. Okay, so so yeah, so I, there is at the moment no benefit in using one or another. Although uh, I have really nice experience with tyrosamide, and I can, if I compare how soon I use in cats now and let's say four years ago, I definitely mm. using earlier, and sometimes I even use earlier than you know the stage D because I I, I believe that this cat can benefit. And there are some cats, just obviously for curiosity, where I have, you know, you know, a cat, oh my God, he's not responding for us. My why is not, he should be responding. I swap just a diuretic and suddenly, mm -hmm. and suddenly they are responding super well. I have a couple of cases already like that as well. Okay, so do you tend to use furosemide and then if, when we lose if, Yeah, yeah, and I, when I see, we'll yeah, I go to furosemide and, or if I think the client is not, you know, compliant or mm -hmm. struggle to give a third dose, I prefer to use furosemide as well in right-sided congestive heart failure, and, and basically in cases that I'd say, well, this cat should be responding better to furosemide, and he's never seen furosemide in his life. Why is, that, is, why is he doing this? And I swapped to furosemide, and I have a couple of cases that I cannot explain why they respond really well. Okay, no, that's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that answered Roger's question there. Very thorough. Thank you, Joelle. Um, hi, Pascal. Um, thanks for coming. We've got a message. He's asked, how many B lines do you consider cats positive for oh, pulmonary that's good, edema? Yes, that's that's a good question. You know, uh, I I am to be honest, I got ready for that question because I in fact there are a few studies and I went to look through studies. So one study says that it's uh, three in one place, okay, uh, okay, or two in two different places, okay. Now, if I if you ask me if I whether follow that rule, I don't. I usually see. I think usually is either very obvious for me. Okay, or not. I don't really count how many B lines. So I do see, well, there are a lot of B lines, or there is just one. Uh, and then obviously, if there is just one and I cannot see any other, I don't consider. But the study that used and the study that shows that is beneficial um, use as three B lines, okay, uh, in one single place or two in different place, more than one place, basically. Okay, so that's, okay. that's a good question. The only thing I would say is I had a couple of cases where we need to be careful with the B lines because it's, it's a very nice and, and handy thing to use. But uh, anything that can cause edema or inflammation, inflammatory fluid can cause B lines. 
Okay, uh -huh. so I had a few cases that arrived to me a long time ago with really high doses of frostbite and they have neoplasia or they have pneumonia. Okay, so always bear in mind, put together the B lines with a big left atrium. Okay, do not, do not consider B lines just by, by itself because it can lead to, to uh, a few, um, you know, cats that might, they might receive frostbite and in fact, they don't have, um, uh, you know, pulmonary edema. Okay. okay. I just saw uh, another message from Pascal in regards to when you're re re referring to in one place, are we talking in one intercostal space? Yeah, so yeah. We, in theory, you need to scan for place. Let me just uh, go back uh, just to show you. In th and that's again, Pascal, that's, that's in theory, okay? Uh, why is in theory? Because a lot of times you just, you, you put the probe and you know already, isn't it? So look at this. So you have these four places, okay? And then on, on another side as well, obviously. So if you have one of these places with more than two B lines, in theory is a positive test. That's, and bear in mind, this is the criteria that was used in this study that uh, uh, was considered positive for B lines, okay? So that's, that's the, their own way that was decided in an arbitrary way. And basically we mm. took it, we extrapolate from there. But, um, but they, that's are the places. So the caudal, periheilar, in the middle and then in here um, cranial. So we try to do, and if you see a few B lines more than in more than you know to, to place, I do tend to, I mean most of the cases I do send, I do I tend to see say, you know, look at this. They have one, two, three, four, uh, yeah. another one here that is quite confluent. That's that's quite suggestive. If I only find like two B lines in each spot, I would like to have a bit more of convincing diagnostics. I have to be honest with you. I probably would start with frostbite if I have a big left atrium. But the problem is it with the left atrium. Let's say you have a left atrium that is just moderately enlarged, not like horrible, and you have B lines. Okay, I might start frostbite, but I always keep in my mind that if he does not respond, I need to look for something else. Okay, There's, I hope it, this makes sense for you. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And Pascal, if you have any follow up, do let us know. Um, we've got more questions. So I'll yeah. try and speed through. What would be the best way to treat a patient with severe azotemia and pleural effusion? Okay, that's cool. Uh, that's a very important question, which I uh, obviously I didn't have time to address that. For, for So pleural effusion, okay, definitely drain the patient because the, the reason for that is because if you use uh, frosmide, that will take ages to get rid of the of the perfusion. On top mm. of this, you are making that patient very azotemic, okay? So because you're gonna use a very high dose, it's going, oh, it's not working, let's use more frostmite. It's not, that's not working, let's use more frostmite. And then it will end up very azotemic. So always drain, because then you might end up that you don't need to use such a high doses just to keep the fluid out of the uh, chest cavity, okay? And, and that's always a, a big concern, either with perfusion or even pulmonary edema, isn't it? So if we have, um, to address a patient with frostbite and the kidneys are already high, always bear in mind that the priority is always what can kill a patient first. So if the, your issue is the heart and is life-threatening, go with the frostbite. The, the, at the moment, the, pre, the paradigm in humans has changed. And we vets, even cardiologists, even the specialists, we still follow the old paradigm, okay? So and now in humans, in fact, if you give frostbite, the, clean, the, the patient gets better and gets azotemic is when one of the best pronouncing indicators, okay? If he gets azotemic, if he gets better, okay? And uh, so if he gets azotemic and does not improve is one of the worst ones. So in fact, increasing both things in humans is quite a good thing. It means that frostbite is working and, mm. the clean, and the patient is improving. So I tend to say to the owners, the kidneys will, it will suffer a little bit with this. It will become azotemic, but as far as is asymptomatic for the azotemia, I don't mind. I okay. will monitor. I'll carry on monitoring. And the same here. But with a with a perfusion is particularly important questions because we don't need to use horrible doses of frostbite to address uh, in that situation. Okay, we drain, we drain, and um, and then we can carry on with a minimal effective dose of frostbite. Okay, lovely. But we have a follow up question on that from somebody else in regards to active chest drain. So do yeah. you ever do you recommend? I I, I, I never use. Um, I to be honest, uh, I never have to, to, to use them. Um, but I um, I mean, I'm assuming that if we can drain the fusion. Um, uh, when I mean active chest drains, can you just still check whether this to leave them there on uh, on on the patient or uh, or just mean just uh, draining with a with a drain? 
Resi, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly there. If Is that in answer to your what, question? Is it active chest drains? I wonder if he means like um, a grenade drain, like a yeah, continual no, oh, suction okay, okay, okay. drain. Yes, okay. That no, would be no, my no, interpretation no, of no, that. No. Yeah, I, I never use that because hopefully, hopefully by uh, draining the first time, knowing that it's cardiac patient, if we start with frosamide, it should not recur. Okay. The, okay. the ones that the ones that recur, I mean, maybe the question is is in that way, is the ones that are really bad. I mean, and we have, you know, patients that after two or three days they are refusing again. Those ones are the ones that we need to discuss euthanasia if, okay. if, if the virus is is not working. So we have the initial drainage, and we we start diuretics, and yeah, and we then we hope and that we wouldn't need to drain yeah, again. It should, then. it should not come back. If it comes back, is because they are resistant frostmite. The frosmite those, you know, is you know is not adequate, and that's why it's coming back. That's unlikely. Yeah. Um, and those ones, the ones that recover very quickly, are assuming these are not inadequate diuresis. That's probably a conversation with the owner saying that we might not be able to to address that. I never, we never, you know, you know, maybe he knows as well, but we have pleural ports that we can apply. You know, for most of the times, it's for chemotherapy, uh, you know, for mesotheliomas in dogs that we can just train with a pro port. We, I have never seen that in cat and I don't know anyone that has done that in a cat. Okay. Uh, yeah, he's, um, he or she has added to that. I use the drain with like the plastic pumps or like the grenade ones, I think. Um, but that was in a dog okay. and they ended up, uh, it did end in PTS, unfortunately. Yeah, sometimes sometimes if they have resistance, uh, we don't know how, for how fast cats can develop resistance for asthma, but in, in dogs has been reported as a short period as 14 days. So obviously, if he's in a situation like that where you know you are giving the adequate diuresis and you know a considerable nice dose of frosamide and he comes back, that's probably not a good sign. For, sorry. Okay. We had a question. I don't want to miss it, David. Thank you. And it's a little while ago. Um, so sorry we took so long to get to your question. Um, he, David's asked, what is the frequency of ascites in feline cardiomyopathy? Very rare. Very rare. So okay. I, I'm going to be honest. Um, David, I mean, I, I think I have not seen a right-sided congestive heart failure signs with ascites. Maybe until recently, but that's what different. It was a, a third degree AV block in a cat with a low heart rate. So that was in a, with ascites. But, uh, but I, I think before that, I probably the last one was back in Liverpool. So that probably will go back to 2016, 17. So for me, it's, why it's really rare to see those. Um, and they are either, most of the times, I feel that, you know, with end stage cardiomyopathies, most of the times they end up being symptomatic for, you know, left sided, but they can also be symptomatic for right sided. And because arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathies at the moment is so rare, at least, at least I don't tend to see it, and is the main cause for right sided congestive heart failure, I don't tend to see it. So I think it's quite rare. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got time for some more questions, Joelle. We've yes. got. Um, a question on pro BMP: How useful is it, or how should we be using it in health in suspected healthy cats with no signs of heart disease? Uh, this person goes on to add they have a client who has three British short hair cats from the same litter. One died um, due to a thromboembolism and congestive heart failure, and so she was asking if we could screen the other two cats apart from an echo. Yeah. Okay, that's quite a good question. So. Um, I think uh, to answer that question, I think the best usefulness of that NP1P is a snap test at the moment, at the moment, okay? Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really nice. I mean, even when I was working at back, back at Willows um, uh, and, you know, at, um, at Liverpool, I thought this would be also something really nice for our interns to have, because let's say, you know, I might take an hour to arrive and it needs to, so they can all do a snap test. If it's positive, most likely, most likely, okay, heart. If he's negative, then they know for sure. Now, yeah. to screen, the problem here, that would be amazing if we could screen with a, with a biomarker, isn't it? So mm. that would be amazing. Uh, the problem here is if he's increased, definitely suggest an echo. If he's negative, the only problem is that we cannot say that there is no heart disease, okay? So for screening purpose, is not very good, unfortunately. Um, troponin is slightly better. Proto troponin that in that case is slightly better. So if he's positive, most likely we have a heart condition. But the problem is if he's negative, then we might not. We might still have an underlying heart disease uh, or feline cardiomyopathy without having a significant increase in troponin. Okay. Okay. So it's it's the same for. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So so for screening, that's a problem we have. Um, that's quite. Um, that's you know 
you know, it would be amazing if we could do, could do that. And it, that's the same for humans as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, how often do we scan to monitor for deterioration if we have detected HCM stage A or B1? So how often in like the interval of space? Okay, yes. so the, obviously stage A uh, at the moment, we because there is no changes in the heart, so it's just predisposed to, we don't, I mean, we cannot scan them, unfortunately, but the stage B1, I tend to say every six months, okay? I tend to say every six months. Now, every six months to a year, to be honest with you. Now, the only thing here is if you scan today and that is a mild to moderate left heat enlargement, I might ask this patient to come a little bit earlier or let's say rather than coming in a year, coming in six months or even four months, because I'll, I'll be kind of convincing that, um, you know, sorry, convinced that the, 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 by then I already meet the criteria to be a stage B2 and start clopidogrel, okay? So um, uh, another thing that I, 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 I mean, this is just a, a, a sideline, I, I have not mentioned, there is now a condition, uh, and this is not to answer that question, but I, I, I probably should have mentioned in the talk, there is another condition that sometimes can cause uh, another extra issue, and then it's been another confounding factor for many other things that we've been discussing here. The, now that we have something called transient myocardial thickening, which is happens mostly in young cats that have a stressful event, and they look like an HCM cats, okay? So you look like an HCM, and then after a while, there is nothing. Okay, so this is obviously another confounding factor for screening as well, um, cats. Um, and uh, and I think I, I've seen one recently, to be honest, that was thick and then is not thick anymore. So obviously, just as a, a side note, um, just to explain why all the biomarkers, all the troponin, can be high and then can be normal. So it can be quite difficult to, for sure, to 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 be to be certain. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Rue that was about frozen terosomite. I think we've covered that one. Do let me know if that's not the case and you have yeah. any follow up, uh, Rue. Um, and in patients that are hypo hypothermic and yeah. dehydrated slash hypotensive, is frozenamide contraindicated until more stable? That's a really good question. Yes, that's a good question. So, uh, in fact, hypothermia is one of the signs that can suggest heart failure rather than respiratory disease, okay? Now, the, um, the regarding the dehydration, the mm -hmm. way I think is, if we have a dehydrated patient, in theory, that patient should be hypovolemic as well, okay? So if he's in failure, that something is not right. So uh, something should not be right, because if we have a, a dehydrated patient, he's already dehydrated. So, you know, in theory, mm -hmm. frostmite, you know, the, the, the goal of frostmite is, in fact, taking fluid and making him I mean, let's say mildly dehydrated or just close to the, you know, to mild dehydration. So if he's mildly dehydrated and he's still in failure, something should not be right. Okay. So I'll probably yeah. be looking for other conditions. Um, uh, but uh, if let's assume, let's assume definitely that uh, he's dehydrated and let's say the dog, you know, sorry, the cat or the dog, to be honest, who has been already mm. on frostmite. So if that's the case, maybe we need to, uh, you know, slightly decrease frosmide until it gets dehydrated. Uh, the problem with the fluids is that it is kind of difficult to, to monitor those. We can give a very slow rate with a hypotonic to make this patient dehydrated again, but that's assuming the patient does not have, um, you know, uh, current pulmonary edema. So what I'm trying to say is, if he's a patient that's been treated already for heart failure, and then suddenly for any other reason, you know, stop eating, stop drinking, there is another systemic disease, mm, yeah. become dehydrated, then, Yes, we can decrease slightly the frost might eventually be a very careful fluid therapy with hypotonics uh, cell line, uh, just to make it hydrated again, okay? And then we go back to the normal dose of frost might. That's what I tend to do. But if it's a patient that we suspect that has pulmonary edema and is dehydrated, I will probably check other causes. Okay. So yeah, if in, if in the initial presentation, we're thinking heart failure, but we're dehydrated, we want to be thinking maybe there's something else going yeah, on. Yeah, something else, yeah. But if we're on long-term frozomide as a known heart patient, yeah, and, and, and the then is, we and the, become yeah, unwell for other reasons. For other reasons, I'll definitely drop because that's the most, uh, the, 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 you know, there's the ventral, ventral flexion neck I showed mm, in the cat, yeah. exactly what happened. He had been on frozomide, they don't carry on giving frozomide, without him eating for three or four days, without drinking, what right. happened? He, doesn't, he does not have intake of potassium, hypokalemia, that it can be quite bad. Um, and then obviously this cat was also on very high dose of frosamide. Mm -hmm. um, so he got very hypokalemic. And that, that cat particularly, we have to give, you know, a, a quite um, a strong supplementation of potassium 
to be to give as less as fluid as possible to keep him you know back to normal normal kalemia again yeah. um so but that cat didn't present with dyspnea okay so that's different if we if that cat would have presented with dyspnea and dehydration uh, I probably think that the you know definitely heart failure should be at least under control okay thank you that was that was uh, really helpful I think we have come to the end of our questions and we still have 50 people uh, in attendance so I hope everyone's okay. oh, really, so oh, yeah everyone's really enjoyed okay. uh, our discussion there Joel so thank you ever okay, so much cool. for that and thank you all for staying on if you do have any last minute questions please do feel free to pop those over uh, but otherwise I think um, we've come to the end uh, we have had a couple of questions regarding recording of the webinar this evening so that will be um, process of the next couple of days um, I think we will likely include the Q&A as well um, and we will then email that over to you guys so that will be coming into your inbox uh, within the next few days Okay, well, thanks ever so much for coming. We've had lovely feedback as well, Joelle. So thank you for your time this evening. Cool, um, thank and you. And thank you for sticking with us through the tech issues. And now you can go use your internet okay. for other things. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you so much, okay? Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, bye-bye.